One, where can I find a friend? It was a hit and run waiting to happen. Tracy, a young woman with two preschoolers, roamed the department store, hoping to find something to fit both her budget and her image of herself, before she and her husband had a third child. Though she loved her husband and her children, she longed for something she had not yet found. Shopping, cooking, and a part time job left her little time for herself. She felt overwhelmed at times. Sometimes she even felt as though she lived in a cage. I need a break, Tracy told herself as she strolled through the Mrs. Sizes, and an adult to talk to. Tracy thought back to those days in high school when she would hang out with her friends and dream about boys they would marry and the trips they would take around the world. The freedom in those friendships had enabled her to dream, and that is what she missed more than the dreams themselves. Her daydream caused her not to notice her three year old diving into the center of a rack of coats. At the same moment, Lana, a single woman, disabled by cerebral palsy, wheeled through the aisles of blouses and sweaters. She seldom shopped alone because it was difficult to get to the store. The residential facility where she lived offered only sporadic field trips to the mall, and even when a van was available, the cost was usually more than what Lana had left over from the monthly state stipend of $35. The rare occasion that Lana did go shopping was usually a painful experience. When she tried to communicate with the clerks, they would either ignore her or give up trying to understand her questions. Sometimes Lana left with the wrong size because it was easier to pull something off the nearest shelf in the hope that it would fit or look nice, or she would return home without having purchased anything at all. On the day of the incident, Lana had promised herself this trip would be different. I'm not going to leave without the blouse I really want, she told herself, no matter what it takes. For years, Lana had lived in a world where people dictated her schedule and defined her limits. Her friends were of the medical and professional variety a therapist to hold her while she walked the parallel bars, an attendant to help her bathe, a speech therapist to get her to talk clearly, a social worker to file the latest batch of papers with the state. They were all pleasant people, but none touched the real Lana, the Lana inside. Kids stared at her. Strangers remained just that, parting themselves to make room for her to steer her wheelchair through. The more compassionate would sometimes step in and help, but would never linger for conversation. Eye contact was limited to glances. She had long ago given up hope that the glances would change to genuine smiles. That a helper would become a friend. Like a caged lion, she accepted the bars that kept her from such relationships. She, too, lived in a cage. Then it happened. Tracy's child leaped out of the coats just as Lana passed by in her wheelchair. Lana jerked back in surprise, her body thrashing in uncontrolled spasms, her foot pushed against the floor, sending her wheelchair in reverse and knocking over the display of mannequins. Plastic arms, legs, and heads crashed down around Lana. She froze in terror and embarrassment. Her hands covered her head as if she were waiting for someone to strike her. Tracy heard the crash and turned in time to see the last mannequin limb hit the ground. She ran to rescue the victims. A surge of emotions gripped her anger at her child for being involved, embarrassment that she would be blamed for the mishap. And then fear that she wouldn't know how to handle the huddled shape she saw in the wheelchair. What do I do? she thought. Lana peered out from under her arms. Before her stood the three year old, behind him, the mother, looking confused and flustered. Are you okay? Tracy whispered. Lana nodded jerkily. I'm so sorry. Here, Michael, she said to her son, you pick up the pieces and put them on the stand. The child did not move but rather stared at Lana. Come on, honey, help me. Tracy tugged at Michael's arm while she began picking up parts. Lana stared back at the child. She worked to say something, but Tracy's insistence with Michael cut her off. The store clerk had come to the scene by this time. Don't worry, folks, she said to Tracy. We'll clean up here. You continue shopping with your friend. Oh, she's not. Tracy stopped mid sentence, afraid the words might hurt the disabled woman's feelings. Lana looked up at Tracy, acknowledging the attempt with a weak smile. 
Mommy, what's wrong with the lady? Michael asked. Nothing, honey. She's just... Tracy didn't know how to answer. She wanted to get out of there as soon as possible. I'm disabled, Lana worked to say. Um, disabled is what came out. The boy stood back a little and stared at the jaws that were clenched in a big grin. He clung to his mother's legs. I'm really sorry, Tracy said. Michael's never met anyone who's crippled before. Neither have I, thought Tracy. Well, I guess we'll keep shopping. Are you okay? Lana nodded, wanting to say more and hoping the accident would somehow linger. But she could see that a restless baby in Tracy's walker and a rambunctious boy and a mom on a mission could not be held captive to her need for finding a blouse and her need to find a friend. Tracy looked at Lana. She wondered how the woman got there, wondered if she understood much, wondered what Lana thought of her. Tracy looked into Lana's eyes and thought she saw a glimmer of something she remembered from long ago. But seeing the jerky motions of Lana's body, the wheelchair, the strained attempts at talking, Tracy knew that Lana was part of a different world. Tracy went on her way. Nothing I can do here, she thought. I've got to keep shopping and then get home to clean, and then to McDonald's, and then maybe to find a friend somewhere. Lana made her way to the van without a purchase. Tracy walked through the aisles on her search. Her face flushed, hot in embarrassment for quite some time. The women never saw each other again. Two caged tarts in search of a friendship that could have made all the difference to them and all the difference to the world around them. A Call for Friendship Lana's and Tracy's story is often rehearsed in our world between all kinds of people, not just between those who are able or disabled. Our society is marked by alienation. We cocoon in our homes, in our personal computers, in our televisions. The ease with which people move from place to place makes us cautious in our relationships, and the commodity of trust seems to be in short supply. Against such a backdrop, how could a book like this ever lead people to make friends with a disabled person? Fostering any kind of friendship is hard, let alone with a person who seems different. Why take on the impossible task of bridging such different worlds? First, the worlds aren't as different as we imagine. Oh yes, my life is different because of my disability and things like pressure sores, catheters, and corsets that wear wounds on my hips. Then there are the obvious emotions involving deep and permanent loss. But the basic issues of life are the same with me as they are with you. I need love and a sense of security. I wonder about my place in this world. I have tastes and opinions. I battle the flesh and sometimes wish that I was better, faster, kinder, smarter, prettier, and younger. And I want heaven to be here now. Second, God wants to see the people in these worlds join together. As you will discover in a later chapter, Jesus Christ lived and breathed friendship, especially friendships with people with disabilities. This book isn't based on my vision for the 549 million disabled people in this world who need a friend. It is based on Jesus' burning passion to see his people reach everyone in the world for whom he died. His passion burns especially hot for those the world counts as weak. Third, the people in these seemingly different worlds have so much to offer each other. I have met scores of people, disabled and non-disabled, who have found in each other true friendship. The people involved and their families have had their lives changed for the better because of such friendships. This last point needs more explanation if you are to continue reading this book. You probably selected this book because you have a heart. You want to minister. You want to help. Great! You're A1 in my book. But consider what's in it for you. Sounds a bit worldly to be basing your friendship on a self-centered view, doesn't it? But don't forget that God promised us blessings if we love as He commanded us to love. Consider the direct promise described by Jesus in Luke 14, 13 and 14, 
when we extend our friendship to people with disabilities. He said that we would be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous when we extend friendship to people with disabilities. I can't imagine how God will repay, but His smallest payback exceeds our greatest sacrifice in eternal proportions. Beyond that future promise, there are blessings for today when we love others. Love, expressed in friendship, includes in its biblical description the idea of personal gain. John Piper's book, Desiring God, has a wonderful chapter on this idea. He says that we often overlook this aspect of love when we read 1 Corinthians 13. Paul says, If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. What a curious statement to make. Could there be a gain to something as selfless as love? Consider Paul's words to the Ephesians. It is more blessed to give than to receive. We assume blessed means good or right. Actually, it means happy or joyous, benefiting the giver. Again, how odd that we should entertain that God should entertain the notion that there is something for us in the transaction of love. Friendships have love at their core, and initiating friendships with people with disabilities is likewise an initiation of love. There is benefit for the recipient. There is benefit for the giver. What blessings will you find in befriending a disabled person? Each friendship has its unique joys, but let me share several I have found to be common to many relationships between disabled and non-disabled people. You will find someone with whom to share your struggles. Not every disabled person qualifies as a marriage and family counselor, nor are they the sweet, ever-patient Corey Ten Boom-like grandmother. But many are more willing to listen. Don't assume that a disabled person only thinks about ramps, Medicaid, and if the handicap stalls in the bathrooms are wide enough. And please don't think that every disabled person is desperate to have someone, anyone, pay a tad of attention to their needs. Perhaps the greatest asset that most disabled people possess is patience. We have had scads of time, whether waiting in line or waiting to get up in the morning, to cultivate the art of sitting and listening. Disabled people can relate. 2 Corinthians 1.4 reminds us that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Lana, in our story, may not be able to flash wallet photos of her firstborn, but her struggles in learning endurance and patience have prepared her well to be all ears when it comes to Tracy's problems. You will find someone to remind you of the grace of God. Not every person with a disability is gracious, but the message disabled people underscore just by being is that God is gracious. He is in the miraculous business of sustaining the weak, always drawing us into a deeper dependency on Him. Disabilities and others remind us of this powerful truth. Friends with disabilities remind us of God's grace in another way. For without Christ, you were once disabled spiritually, unable to move into His kingdom as well as blind to His purposes and deaf to His voice. But by His grace, you are being made whole, and it's the disability in others which serves as God's physical audio-visual aid of how He's working spiritually in the lives of us all. You will find someone to slow you down. My friends would laugh. Johnny, you're anything but slow. You keep us running after you. Touché. But getting a disabled friend from here to there may take longer than you realize. Dressing routines may double preparation time. Walking beside a person with a walker may limit your sightseeing. Explaining something to a mentally disabled person might be frustrating because they don't get it now. These may seem to be annoyances at first, But the effect of the slower speed, if accepted, teaches you the value of steadiness and enjoying the journey as much as the destination. You will find someone to stretch you as a person. You have spent enough time getting comfortable with life. It is time to develop your character, expand your horizons, trust in God's hand beyond your small world. You'll find yourself coping with new problems and solving them together. 
Self-consciousness will begin to fade as you encounter awkward and sometimes humorous situations. You should hear the stories of friends who have gotten themselves into scrapes with department stores and airlines. One friend had braved a revolving door of a store with her friend in a wheelchair. We won't make it, Donna had said from her place in the chair. We'll make it, Cheryl had said. They didn't. Cheryl could get Donna in, but as the door and the chair made its arc, they found that the chair was angled in such a way as to get it stuck about three-fourths of the way in. A couple of hours later, Donna was unstuck, and the two were on their way, laughing for years to come about their adventure. A Godly Desire Some of you may still view such self-centered reasons as somehow tainting the friendship. But consider the person with a disability for a moment and how they would feel if you held to a sense of duty as a basis for your friendship. They have enough dutiful people in their lives that have taken them on as a mission of love. How will they know if you really love them and whether or not they are really valued if you do not seek out a relationship based on your desire? Are you ready to discover a new joy?